Chapter 15. The Footsteps Die Out for Ever Along the Paris streets the death carts rumble, hollow and harsh. Six tumbrils carry the day's wine to la guillotine, or the devouring and insatiate monsters imagined since imagination could record itself, affused in the one realization, guillotine. And yet there is not in France, with its rich variety of soil and climate, a blade, a leaf, a root, a sprig, a peppercorn, which will grow to maturity under conditions more certain than those that have produced this horror, crush humanity out of shape once more under similar hammers, and it will twist itself into the same tortured forms. So the same seed of rapacious license and oppression over again, and it will surely yield the same fruit according to its kind. Six tumbrils roll along the streets. Change these back again to what they were, thou powerful enchanter time, and they shall be seen to be the carriages of absolute monarchs, the equipages of feudal nobles, the toilettes of flaring Jezebels, the churches that are not my father's house, but dens of thieves, the huts of millions of starving peasants. No, the great magician who majestically works out the appointed order of the Creator never reverses his transformations. If thou be changed into this shape by the will of God, say the seers to the enchanted in the wise Arabian stories, then remain so. But if thou wear this form through mere passing conjuration, then resume thy former aspect. Changeless and hopeless, the tumbrils roll along. As the sombre wheels of the six carts go round, they seem to plough up a long, crooked furrow among the populace in the streets. Ridges of faces are thrown to this side and to that, and the ploughs go steadily onward. So used to the regular inhabitants of the houses to the spectacle that in many windows there are no people, and in some the occupation of the hands is not so much as suspended while the eyes survey the faces in the tumbrils. Here and there the inmate has visitors to see the sight. Then he points his finger with something of the complacency of a curator or authorized exponent to this cart and to this, and seems to tell who sat here yesterday and who there the day before. Of all the riders in the tumbrils, some observe these things, and all things on their last roadside, with an impassive stare. Others with a lingering interest in the ways of life and men, some seated with drooping heads are sunk in silent despair. Again there are some so heedful of their looks that they cast upon the multitude such glances as they have seen in theatres and in pictures. Several close their eyes and think, or try to get their straying thoughts together. Only one, and he a miserable creature of a crazed aspect, is so shattered and made drunk by horror that he sings and tries to dance. Not one of the whole number appeals by look or gesture to the pity of the people. There is a guard of sundry horsemen riding abreast of the tumbrils, and faces are often turned up to some of them, and they are asked some question. It would seem to be always the same question, for it is always followed by a press of people towards the third cart. The horsemen abreast of that cart frequently point out one man in it with their swords. The leading curiosity is to know which he is. He stands at the back of the tumbrel, with his head bent down to converse with a mere girl who sits on the side of the cart and holds his hand. He has no curiosity or care for the scene about him, and always speaks to the girl. 
Here and there in the long street of Saint Honore, cries are raised against him. If they move him at all, it is only to a quiet smile as he shakes his hair a little more loosely about his face. He cannot easily touch his face, his arms being bound. On the steps of a church, awaiting the coming up of the tumbrils, stand the spy and prison sheep. He looks into the first of them, not there. He looks into the second, not there. He already asks himself, has he sacrificed me? When his face clears as he looks into the third. Which is Evremond, says a man behind him. That, at the back there. With his hand in the girl's? Yes. The man cried, Down, Evermond, to the guillotine, all aristocrats! Down, Evermond! Hush, hush, the spy entreats him timidly. And why not, citizen? He is going to pay the forfeit. It will be paid in five minutes more. Let him be at peace. But the man continued to exclaim, down, Evremond! The face of Evremond is for a moment turned towards him. Evremond then sees the spy and looks attentively at him and goes his way. The clocks are on the stroke of three, and the furrow ploughed among the populace is turning round to come on into the place of execution and end. The ridges thrown to this side and to that now crumble in and close behind the last plough as it passes on, for all are following to the guillotine. In front of it, seated in chairs, as in a garden of public diversion, are a number of women busily knitting. On one of the foremost chairs stands the vengeance looking about for her friend. Therese, she cries in her shrill tones, who has seen her? Therese de Farge. She never missed before, says a knitting woman of the sisterhood. No, nor will she miss now, cries the vengeance petulantly. Therese! Louder, the woman recommends. Ay, louder, vengeance, much louder, and still she will scarcely hear thee. Louder yet, vengeance, with a little oath or so added, and yet it will hardly bring her. Send other women up and down to seek her, lingering somewhere, and yet, although the messengers have done dread deeds, it is questionable whether of their own wills they will go far enough to find her. "'Bad fortune!' cries the vengeance, stamping her foot in the chair. "'And here are the tumbrils, and Evremond will be dispatched in a wink, and she not here. "'See her knitting in my hand, and her empty chair ready for her. "'I cry with vexation and disappointment!' As the vengeance descends from her elevation to do it, the tumbrils begin to discharge their loads. The ministers of St. Guillotine are robed and ready. Crash! A head is held up, and the knitting women, who scarcely lifted their eyes to look at it a moment ago when it could think and speak, count one. The second tumbril empties and moves on. The third comes up. Crash! And the knitting women, never faltering or pausing in their work, count two. The supposed Evremond descends, and the seamstress is lifted out next after him. He has not relinquished her patient hand in getting out, but still holds it as he promised. He gently places her with her back to the crashing engine that constantly whirs up and falls, and she looks into his face and thanks him. But for you, dear stranger, I should not be so composed, for I am naturally a poor little thing, faint of heart. Nor should I have been able to raise my thoughts to him who was put to death, that we might have hope and comfort here to-day. I think you were sent to me by heaven. Or you to me, says Sidney Carton. Keep your eyes upon me, dear child, and mind no other object. 
I mind nothing while I hold your hand. I shall mind nothing when I let it go. If they are rapid, they will be rapid. Fear not. The two stand in the fast thinning throng of victims, but they speak as if they were alone. Eye to eye, voice to voice, hand to hand, heart to heart, these two children of the universal mother, else so wide apart and differing, have come together on the dark highway to repair home together and to rest in her bosom. Brave and generous friend, will you let me ask you one last question? I am very ignorant and it troubles me just a little. Tell me what it is. I have a cousin, an only relative and an orphan like myself, whom I love very dearly. She is five years younger than I, and she lives in a farmer's house in the south country. Poverty parted us, and she knows nothing of my fate, for I cannot write, and if I could, how should I tell her? It is better as it is. Yes, yes, better as it is. What I have been thinking as we came along, and what I am still thinking now as I look into your kind, strong face, which gives me so much support, is this. If the Republic really does good to the poor, and they come to be less hungry, and in all ways to suffer less, she may live a long time. She may even live to be old. What then, my gentle sister? Do you think— the uncomplaining eyes in which there is so much endurance fill with tears, and the lips part a little more and tremble, that it will seem long to me while I wait for her in the better land where I trust both you and I will be mercifully sheltered. It cannot be, my child, there is no time there and no trouble there. You comfort me so much, I am so ignorant. Am I to kiss you now? Is the moment come? Yes. She kisses his lips. He kisses hers. They solemnly bless each other. The spare hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet, bright constancy is in the patient face. She goes next before him, is gone. The knitting women count Twenty-two. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The murmuring of many voices, the upturning of many faces, the pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd, so that it swells forward in a mass, like one great heave of water, all flashes away. 23. They said of him about the city that night that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers by the same axe, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold not long before to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had given any utterance to his, and they were prophetic, they would have been these. I see Barsad and Cly, Defarge, the vengeance, the juryman, the judge, long ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old, perishing by this retributive instrument before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city and a brilliant people rising from this abyss, and in their struggles to be truly free, in their triumphs and defeats, through long years to come, I see the evil of this time and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth, gradually making expiation for itself and wearing out. I see the lives for which I lay down my life peaceful, useful, prosperous and happy in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom who bears my name. 
I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored and faithful to all men in his healing office, and at peace. I see the good old man, so long their friend, in ten years' time enriching them with all he has, and passing tranquilly to his reward. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts, and in the hearts of their descendants, generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed. And I know that each was not more honoured and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. I see that child who lay upon her bosom and who bore my name, a man winning his way up in that path of life which once was mine. I see him winning it so well that my name is made illustrious there by the light of his. I see the blots I threw upon it faded away. I see him, foremost of just judges and honoured men, bringing a boy of my name with a forehead that I know and golden hair to this place, then fair to look upon with not a trace of this day's disfigurement and I hear him tell the child my story with a tender and a faltering voice. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. End of Book 3, Chapter 15, recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com End of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens